Welcome to Books of Our Time, brought to you by the Massachusetts School of Law and seen nationwide. Today we shall discuss a book which discusses the efforts to publish ace books based not just on historians' prior knowledge of the Soviet Union, but extensively on the Soviet Union's archives, which were partially opened in the 1990s after the collapse of communism. The series, extensively based on the archives, is called The Annals of Communism and has been published by the Yale University Press. The efforts to publish books based extensively on the archives was thought up and spearheaded by Jonathan Brett, who has now written about his experiences and about some of his views of Russia entitled Inside the Stalin Archives. Mr. Brent is with me today to discuss his book, and I am Lawrence Herr Velvel, the Dean of the Massachusetts School of Law. Jonathan, thank you for coming up from New York. As I occasionally do, an audience that as was true with uh, Ira Burko and some others. You and I grew up a mile or so apart, never knew each other until today. <laughs> say, say with me. Uh, tell me, two, two questions related. How many books have been published now in the on communism series, and what do you hope will be accomplished by this series? Right now, the number of books is about 25, maybe 22 titles that range from the history of the fall of the Romanov dynasty up through the Gulag, the history of the Gulag, Stalin's death. We're now working on a big series of books uh, that will be published out of something called Stalin's Personal Archive, a vast trove of materials uh, relating to all of his relations with the KGB, with the military, uh, with Politburo members, etc. What do I want of this? I want to get out of it a true understanding of one of the giant phenomena of the 20th century. It goes back to the 19th century and perhaps we'll go into the 21st, but it is associated with the 20th century, which is the growth, the development, and ultimately the dissolution uh, at least in its overt structures of Soviet communism. To me, this is a matter of great historical importance, not just interest, political importance, educational importance, but, but, but more than that, it's a question of the moral education of our children and future generations of free-thinking people. Uh, we. We did not know, even during the height of the Cold War, the true dimensions of this system that was being uh, fought in the United States. I'm not a Cold Warrior. I was quite opposite to the Cold Warriors. During the Cold War, I was a student at Columbia in the late 60s and early 70s. But I have come to see through the vast material that we've developed how corrupt that system was how despite the fact that the word totalitarian is, is repudiated by most scholars today as a term that accurately uh, describes the nature of that world, how truly totalistic that world was. It was an attempt, it was a system that attempted to define everything in your life from the two you used to the wife you married to the children you had, to the profession you had, and to your belief system in general. And though it was never completely successful, it was successful to a greater extent than we understand, which is why today Russia is returning in many respects to the world that we thought collapsed in 1991. Uh, I, want to, I want you to discuss that, that last point extensively because in reading both your book and in reading the article you recently published in the Chronicle of Higher Education, it seems to me that it's uh, of the essence of what you're seeking to accomplish. In a certain sense, to use Cold War language, you're seeking to have that rolled back 
uh, uh, because it, it's so evil. And we'll get into why this is happening. But a couple of little things that you just mentioned. Uh, you said, uh, it attempted to define uh, even the wife you had. Tell the story about Molotov and his wife and yes. what Stalin told him. M Molotov, uh, Molotov's wife, Zemchuzhina. Now, now, Molotov was whom? Mo Molotov was uh, one of Stalin's closest, closest uh, comrades during the whole uh, uh, revolutionary period. He, he was a bosom buddy of Stalin. A, there, na a name people in my generation heard all the time when we were young. He, uh, the Molotov cocktail. Uh, the, uh, he was the foreign uh, minister during the Second World War. Um, he was called, uh, uh, Stalin used to joke uh, about his last name and call him Malachstein. He was married to a Jewish woman, uh, Zemchuzhina. And Zemchuzhina, for various reasons, fell out of favor with uh, Stalin. Uh, at, at the end of the 40s with the established state of Israel. There was a, a lot going on there and Stalin became very suspicious of any Jew uh, in his government. And, uh, and, and perhaps it was a way of testing Stalin uh, Molotov's loyalty. But he arrested Chuzhina. Before she was arrested, she was expelled from the uh, Central Committee and in this um, meeting where she was expelled, Molotov refused to vote against her. He didn't vote for her, but he abstained from voting. And in his uh, diary, Georgi Dimitrov writes down, this was certainly not correct on the part of Mo It was certainly not correct. And Dimitrov was? The head of the Comintern, the Communist International. Now, another story, which perhaps uh, you were thinking of also, is the story about Stalin's uh, uh, longtime adjutant, uh, well, Postgrobyshev. Let, let, let me stop you right there, if I may, for just a second. Mm -hmm. Molotov complained to Stalin, and I, it, what Stalin said to him is absolutely unforgettable. Yes, well, I think, I think you may be uh, uh, conflating that. Conflating stories? Okay, yes, conflating yeah. the stories, because this has to do okay. with Postgrobyshev, okay. uh, General Postgrobyshev who was a, he became Stalin's secretary after the war. In any case, uh, Postgrobyshev comes home one day in the 30s and discovers that his wife has been arrested. And he runs to Stalin and he says, Comrade Stalin, this is clearly a mistake. My wife is a decent person, a loyal communist, a devoted uh, a member of the party. Please, I beg of you, Stop this, bring her home, I love my wife. He throws himself at Stalin's knees, holds him by the knees and Stalin says, get up, we'll find you another wife. That's the story I was thinking about. It's, uh, that and just goes to show you. Now, people, uh, was it, uh, is the name uh, Rubishoff in Darkness at Noon, the fellow who uh, goes to his death, you know, they're leading yes. him do the dungeons of uh, Lubyanka, the bullet in his head, which is the way they did it. And I gather from your book they usually did it the day after the trial. The trial was a showpiece and... Uh, exactly. Yeah. There's an old saying in the United States, I shouldn't say this on television, but uh, there's an old saying, life's a bitch. After your trial, they gave you one day, next day they took you out and shot you. By the hundreds of thousands, apparently is I, what I gather from your book. The hundreds and hundreds of thousands. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands. Yes. Um, and people like Rubishoff, uh, you describe Ye Yeshoff, I'm not sure. Yes, I'm Yeshoff. Yes, sir. They went to their death, who was head of the secret police during the time of the Great Terror, which yes, I'll sir. ask you to discuss. They went to their death with Stalin's name on their lips, not understanding, you know, if only Stalin knew. That's, yes, if, if only, only Stalin, Stalin knew. They were taken over, as was all of Russia, I guess, psychologically, by what you have called, and I'd like you to explain this, the dream of the great socialist state. Yes. So maybe you could explain what that dream was, it came about, and how it captured people's minds. Well, it had special meaning in Russia. It had a meaning in Russia that was separate from the meaning, I think, in France or Italy or Germany. The meaning in Russia was that they were build the great Russian nation again. And as Stalin wrote in 1928 to Gorky, 
he said, there will be more beggarly Russia. That's over with. There will be a vanguard Russia based on socialist principles. And this was the dream that ignited the country. They wanted that. They wanted to get out of the mud. They wanted to get out of the unbelievable poverty of their lives uh, throughout the whole expanse of this enormous country. And this was the way to do it. They were building something. And they were going to build the great nation. And it was a great nation which uh, that was originally founded entirely on socialist principles. But when the Second World War came along, Stalin realized that these socialist principles weren't enough. Why? Because he also knew something, which is that in the Ukraine and elsewhere, there was still a lot of smoldering resentment against the socialist state, certainly in Ukraine among the Ukrainian peasants. What could he then rely on. And he did something that was extraordinarily clever. He fused this idea of the great Soviet state with Russian nationalism. And he created what uh, Robert Tucker calls Bolshevik nationalism. And this is a very, very powerful force in the minds of people in Russia, so that the uh, rehabilitation of Stalin that you're seeing on the street corners of Moscow and all of the provincial cities in Russia is connected to their deep-seated and satisfied, utterly unsatisfied need to see the realization of those dreams. Um, the fact that it caused 20 million people to die in the labor camps, the fact that 5 million or so Ukrainian peasants died in 1932-33, and four and a half million in Kazakhstan, which we now know, four and a half million out of a population of nine million people in Kazakhstan, that, that country was almost entirely depopulated because of this famine that was being controlled by the government. The fact of the crimes in Katyn, the fact of the deportation of the Kulaks, the deportation of the Crimean Tatars, the, 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 in 1937 alone, 960,000 people were arrested in the party. This is at the height of the purge. And of those 960,000 who were arrested in 1937, over 300 were shot, as you described, after one day of a trial, and the trial usually lasted 50 minutes. Despite this horror, despite the terror, despite everything, this is a country that believes so strongly this idea of the great socialist Russian state that it is willing to have pictures of Stalin on ba boxes of chocolate being sold in Sheremetyevo Airport in Moscow right now. I don't know how you put the word. Is it Rodina, the motherland? Rodina. Rodina. You see that all the time in histories of the yeah. Second World War. It begins to give you just a little insight into what you're talking about. They were always fighting for the road enough, for the mother to one. Exactly. And, and, and I guess this goes, for some reasons, and you know, one would have to ask the question if one were bold, uh, whether perhaps we in the United States don't have a similar point of view in reverse. Uh, they regard Russia as, well, I, I, to say it's the font of everything, I don't, I don't think, but it, it's this great place. Mm -hmm. It's never been a great place. It's been horrible for a thousand years, or it, right. I don't know the history, but <laughs> has Russia ever been a great place by our standards? <laughs> well, not by our standards, but our standards are not their standards. Our standards are not and, their standards. And now, to understand, I, I'd like to ask you a, a, a question about understanding why the dream of socialism combined with nationalism achieve such power and, and I've kind of thought I mean I've searched around for answers but I know I have no facts and no knowledge I do know that you mentioned the, the terrible poverty well Russia was a vast poverty in serfs and it came out of that history and then when it began to industrialize of course as in England or the United States the prolet the working class in the cities the proletariat was in terrible shape and 
that seems to me, I mean, they explain that or add to it or subtract from it, that has seemed to me in my ignorance to be the reason why this dream of a powerful, respected, vanguard industrial state appealed to people. Well, I, I think that's certainly a huge part of it. Um, two parts to this. One, the people of Russia saw that it was through Stalin's collectivization and the industrialization that flowed from it had to get peasants out of the country into the city. He broke the back of the peasantry during the collectiviz collectivization period. He got them into the cities. There was a, this upsurge of productivity. And in fact, in the first years of industrialization, the Soviet Union, at a time when the rest of the Western world was sunk in the depression, was doing rather well. They started building airplanes, they started building uh, dams, they started building buildings. The fact that the dams were often the result of slave labor. The fact that the workers were being treated just as badly as proletarian in, in, in England or the United States or Germany or France in the 19th century never occurred to anybody, but nevertheless, what they saw was that this land that had formerly been a land of slaves under the absolute power of the Tsar was now a land that they all owned. And they envisioned great miracles ahead, great miracles ahead. Stalin invented land uh, right in downtown Moscow. It was like a continual world's fair, except that the world never participated, only the Soviet Union participated, where they would show off the biggest pumpkin, the biggest tomatoes, the, uh, would show off the most perfect sheep. Uh, they would give awards to um, uh, farmers, uh, hero of the Soviet Union second class yeah, yeah. for uh, raising your sheep, yeah. for raising rabbit, for doing this. They would sit on Stalin's lap. They would see baskets of fruit. This was the Garden of Eden that he promised them, and he promised the world. And, and the consequence of this, and I saw this with my own eyes, is that he received tribute from around the world in the, in the um, Museum of the Revolution, there's a whole room devoted to Stalin and the gifts that he received. He received an, a headdress from the uh, Association of American Indian Tribes. He received a beautiful fur coat, magnificent fur coat, uh, uh, from the American Furriers uh, Union in New York City. And uh, he got the fur coat. He, he never wore any of these things. Uh, and he put them in the, in the museum. He, um, he received from, uh, I think it was Colombia or perhaps Brazil, a, um, a telephone uh, that was made out of an armadillo. Uh, it's unbelievable. He received uh, uh, cigar holders made out of uh, machine gun bullets. It's a fantastic collection of things. I don't think an American president gets such things so inventive, so invented, so, so filled with love and tribute. You know, the Stalin is uh, quite vast, 404,000 pieces of paper in this archive. Um, and the archive, interestingly, goes from like 18, I don't know, 80 to 1955, two years after Stalin died. Well, you say, how can it be that uh, there's material in the archive that's beyond the year of his death? Because the news of his traveled slowly throughout many parts of the world in 1955 that were without electricity still, yeah. without telephone. They got the news late, and yet they continued to send condolence letters yeah. to the Committee on yeah. Stalin's death. Uh, it's always been asked or, uh, in the United States that how could people, as late as the 40s and the 50s, and even a few people after that have worshipped at the uh, grail of Soviet communism and even Stalinism. And I, I think that the state of uh, the world, I'd like to comment on this or say whatever you'd like, the state of the world in the late century, which you briefly alluded to, in the West, 
and the knowledge of uh, how backwards Russia had been even into the 1920s. Uh, captured people's minds to the point where they wanted to believe and did believe stuff that you're talking about was the way of the future and that was a dream that they couldn't give up. They could not give up it, uh, give it up and many today won't give it up. Uh, a, a KGB general I know uh, at whose house I had were talking about this very, so I asked him, I said, Sergei, please tell me, yeah. what Give me, you don't have to be worried about anything. You're on a pension. Nobody from the KGB is going to arrest you. We're living in a new world. Speak your mind. Tell me what you thought of Stalin truly. He said, oh, well, Stalin was a terrible tyrant. And he made many mistakes. And uh, he used many wrong methods. He was a monster. But, he said, he pulled Stalin up, uh, pulled Russia up. And that is the phrase they use. He lifted Russia up. He gave it dignity. He gave it, he gave it the ability to be on par with the West. And that's also what affected Americans, American communists. I mean, uh, I, I've, I've got friends whose parents were, died in the world communists, there's no mm -hmm. question. And uh, it seemed to me that it was this, uh, somebody wrote a book once called The Golden Mountains, which I think had something to do with socialism. I, I've got a, a, an American intellectual of the 30s and 40s. But this was the dream of the Soviet state and about the, for the whole world. Yeah. That was the point, for yeah. the whole world. And what was it for? You see, coming back to your earlier question, what, why was he doing it? Like, like Hitler to build the great German nation? No. No. It was an inclusive vision. It was for, as Molotov put it in his eulogy, for all progressive mankind. An eulogy on Stalin's death, Molotov, his wife was still in exile in Kazakhstan, by the way, but he wrote in, in his speech, he said, Stalin will live forever in the hearts of progressive humanity. And so what Stalin was doing, and he believed this, by the way, this was not just a canard, he believed it, and others believed it as well. They were building this for the future of mankind because mankind was jeopardized by the capitalist system, by the, by, by the rich and the powerful magnates who cared nothing about people. What, what is so inexplicable, they were willing to murder so many people on behalf of this beautiful dream. You know, I strangely believe it, I'm not so sure they were entirely wrong about half of what they thought. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're facing yeah. that today, vast outrage at Wall Street mm -hmm. for what's happened in the last couple of years. Yeah. And that's nothing other than a reprise of criticisms of capitalism that goes back to the 1880s. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. You know, you made and, a point. And wait, 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 wait. Let's just take that a couple steps farther. If it had continued down, going down if there hadn't been the intervention of, of the state. Yeah. And many people were saying this is instituting socialist, socialism in America, but America had been allowed to crash and burn the way it crashed and burned in the Depression. If General Motors had gone down, the investment banks gone down, AIG and so on and so forth, we would see a very, very violent core of resentment today against capitalism. We, there's no doubt. In, in the Depression, the thing that the, the Russians couldn't figure out is why the vast majority of American workers were still not creating America. But I think this time, it would have been worse. This time it would have been yeah, worse. Well, this time it would have been a second time in the face exactly. of assurances for 50 years that our, our network, our so-called uh, safety net, uh, hadn't worked because we very, very greedy people do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they say, <clears throat> uh, I imagine you would agree with this, they say that Roosevelt saved capitalism. Maybe saved it from, himself, from itself, but saved capitalism because it was thought that they, they could experience a revolution even back then. When the city, another thing that's relevant and not often thought of is that back then America was, relatively speaking, a poor country, richer than the Russians, yeah. Rich, yeah. richer than the yeah. British, 
but a poor country relative to what it is today. Mm -hmm. So many people do. You see, and this is, this is why the study of this history is so important to me, because yeah. I believe that it's not past. People say, well, it's the past, it's gone. And I believe that the past is always here. The past is always the potentiality, what we can be. Well, you know, you know, you know of course, what Faulkner said. The past is not prologue, it is not even past. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And Faulkner knew what he was talking about. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the absence of knowledge of history, of caring about history, is an, abs an utter disaster, in, in my opinion. But hey, we live with it. Uh, let's talk a little bit, if you don't. Oh, well, one other major, major point in your book. Uh, and you brought it up at lunch. I'm always bringing up on this show for set at lunch because they're so darn fascinating, you know. Uh, you, you made a huge point out of the fact that uh, Stalin was not uh, a madman. He was not, ir he, uh, not irrational. He was in some ways perhaps the ultimate rational man to carry rationality to the most horrid ends. Why don't you explain uh, that? I, I, I think that is going to be the most profound conclusion to the investigation of the Stalin archive. And I've talked with several scholars already who agree completely. When they examine these manuscripts and they see, first of all, A, he truly believed in this. I mean, this, I, I, not that somebody who believes in something isn't able to become pragmatic and opportunistic and set his beliefs. These were his beliefs. He, did, he wasn't secretly a, a capitalist who just made a show of all of this. He believed in it. Two, he was not a madman. He was not a paranoid. I would say he was more paranoid, no less perhaps than Richard Nixon or many other people who've been in government who function in a normal way in a normal society. He was not a criminal in the sense that he was a personal criminal. He didn't shoot people. He didn't hit people. He didn't uh, himself torture people, not like Ivan the Terrible, who threw people out the window, uh, who killed his own son. Uh, there, people try to blame Stalin for the suicide of his wife, but there's no evidence that he shot her. Maybe she died out of despair, but how many wives die out of, how many husbands commit suicide? He was a father, he had three children. His daughter brought home a Jewish husband. He didn't like Jews, but he tolerated a Jew. Uh, eventually, he got her to, uh, 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 to divorce the man, but I could name countless instances of exactly the same thing going on here in the United States in the 1930s, in which a wealthy non-Jewish girl brings home a Jewish husband to the horror of the family. It's no different. No, we can't understand Stalin in this way. We want to understand it that way because we'd love to think of this as a great perversion of history. It is not a perversion of history. That's the whole point. And what you said is that he simply took the logic to the ultimate because he was fearless and because he truly was Nietzschean man. He truly was a man who did not believe that he was constrained by any moral law because all moral laws were relative. You bring to mind something that is in your book, his famous dictum, no man, no problem. No man, no problem. No man, no problem. Yeah. But he was doing it, if, if I understand correctly, whatever he did, he did it because in his mind was a logical requirement for the growth of the great socialist uh, uh, Russian state. Well, he was, uh, yes, and to that extent you could say he was blind he was blind to, to he, he didn't analyze them correctly, and he was blind to pragmatic solutions to the problem, which would from time to time be brought to him, and the people who brought them to him would normally be shot. <laughs> uh, but, that will discourage you from bringing problems to him. Yeah. But let me ask you this. Wasn't George, wasn't the FBI shown a document by some FBI agent in, uh, in, in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona, about the Arabs who were going to fly, and how did it happen that there were no uh, Russians taken? How did that happen? Oh, bureau come on. This is part of 
of, of, of a normal society. This isn't a particular deviation on the part of what was going on there. What was going on there was the institution of an ideology that guided, that, 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 that became the driving engine of that society without which that society couldn't function. That's what Stalin understood. And therefore, he could not tolerate any solutions to problems that in any way endangered the credibility of that ideology. Uh, you point out that at one point, his son wanted something from him, thought he should get it because uh, he was the dictator's son. He said, but, but look, he said, I'm Stalin. Yeah. And you point out Stalin said, to him, you're not Stalin, and I'm not Stalin. Explain the meaning of what okay. he what he said. This this is this anecdote, and it is an anecdote, but it's it's so good I had to put it in the book. Yeah, right, 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 right. right. Uh, and I believe it probably did happen. Vasily, the son, was a lout, and Stalin knew it. He was a good for nothing, a drunk, and at school, he would often terrorize teachers and. And, 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 and schoolmates by saying, I'm Stalin. You give me a bad grade, you can't give me it. I'm Stalin, I'm a Stalin, you can't do that to me. You have a ball, I want your ball. So on and so forth. Like well, the kids in the schoolyard. Yeah. So one day Stalin had had quite enough of this and he grabs him when he came home and he says, listen, you are not Stalin. Even I am not Stalin. Stalin is Soviet power. Stalin is what is written about in the newspapers and what is in the portraits. To me, this says more, this little anecdote reveals more than simply that Stalin understood that, that he was greater than himself. He understood that there was Stalin, the, and I call it in the book, I didn't have a good name for it, I call it the transpersonal power. Yeah, kind of like an, an embodiment of power. And then there is he, the man, and the one has nothing to do with each other. Yeah, yeah. And he had to do everything he could to make sure that this Stalin in the portraits and in the newspapers was the thing that the people worshipped. So we have to re-understand what this cult of personality was all about. It wasn't about Stalin the man. Stalin the man lived like, like an ordinary man. He had, had not an expensive wardrobe. He didn't have 50 pairs of shoes. He, he often lived, uh, worked in a peasant tunic uh, at his house. He ate frugally. He, he wasn't uh, like Yeltsin, constantly drunk. He didn't have women in the... In the uh, the sauna with him, he would be up till four o'clock in the morning reading and writing and thinking and doing. He was in some ways rather ascetic, but he wasn't overly ascetic, not a Robespierre. He understood that this other Stalin had to represent something, this other Stalin, this, this great Stalin that was on the blimps flying over Red Square. Uh, on the airplanes and so on and so forth. That was the Soviet power. That was the embodiment of the capstone of power and that kept the country under control. Do, would you think, this may sound like a question from left field, but wouldn't you think that uh, we do something like that with our celebrification of the press? Well, something like it. But let me tell you what the difference is. In my view, and I agree with you. You can find in bits and pieces here in this country all of the elements we found there put together into one picture. But over here, because we have a democratic liberal state and a democratic liberal society, we have many, many uh, institutions in this country that help to disperse power. So yes, we glorify, heroize, whatever you want to call it, Obama or FDR or JFK or LBJ, or it is. But we have the ABA, we have the AMA, we have the Association of University Professors, 
we have this, we have that, we have all of, we have civic society, to tell you, civil society, with all of those institutions, where this power is essentially broken up into bits and pieces, and that keeps us sane. It makes it possible for us to exist as individuals. When all of that power comes together in one place, you have something that's monstrous and utterly horrendous, murderous, I would say. Now, what are the points you made at lunch that I did not get out of the book along those very lines? Well, people ultimately in the Soviet Union had nowhere to turn because all the that's organizations right. were simply manifestations of whatever Stalin wanted. That's right. Uh, one of the great accomplishments of the revolution was that they destroyed civil society. They eliminated every institution, the last of which was the church. Yeah. But if you read Lenin's uh, orders to destroy the church, you see the ferocity with which that institution was utterly uh, 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 destroyed physically, corrupted spir spiritually. So where does anybody go? If you have a problem, do you go to your teacher? If you have a question, well, how can you go to your teacher? Your teacher is, your teacher is a member of the party. Your teacher is uh, one of those who is a watchdog for the ideology. Do you go to your doctor? How can you go to your doctor? Your doctor is being trained where? In a state-run, in a state-run hospital. Your doctor's phone is probably tapped. Where do you go? There is nowhere to go, and and that and 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 so in in 1953, after Stalin's death, at an interview between Beria and Ignatiev, who had Beria, who had assumed power, uh, Pavel Beria, uh, 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 after Stalin's death, he was interviewing the former head of the Cape in in the 1950s before Stalin died, and he said, "How many?" How many um, informants are there in the Soviet Union? And Ignatiev said, well, uh, paid or unpaid? Uh, uh, unpaid. Uh, because all the paid informants were doing official work. The unpaid ones were doing the unofficial work of informing on their fellow citizens. And Ignatiev said, well, I believe, uh, in my estimation, it must be around 10 million. 10 million, a country of less than 200 million people. It's one in 20 people. That means every time a professor gives a, uh, um, a lecture to 100 students, probably five in that room to go back after class and make a telephone call. You see, there's nowhere you can go. There's nowhere in that world where you can go to express. And I, I'll give you a, one anecdote, which I know is true. Um, and it had consequences. Uh, a very great historian, uh, Natalia Lebedeva, uh, in Russia, she's still alive today, overheard one of, uh, she was a student at the time of the Nuremberg trials, and she overheard a professor of hers who had been at the Nuremberg trial mention something about Katyn, just sort of by the way. That, you, you, why don't you tell uh, the audience what that is? Well, the, the Katyn forest massacre was a massacre of 20,000 approximately officers in the forest of Katyn. The Soviets blamed it on the Nazis, and the Nazis blamed it on the Soviets, and everybody knew that it had been done by the Soviets. And at Nuremberg, the Katyn massacre was supposed to come up, but it never did. The Allies never brought the subject of the murder of these 20,000 Polish officers up as a crime. At the time that it happened in 1940, it was one of the worst state-sponsored massacres three so she hears natalia hears uh her professor say something about katin that it that it was squashed at at nuremberg and she decides she's going to investigate it and does on her own she starts burrowing into records of all sorts and she finds things in the soviet archives that are extremely compromising and because they kept records of everything. And she discovered what they already knew, which was the Soviet Union was responsible for the Katyn massacre. So she writes her dissertation on this subject, and she hands it in to her professor. And the professor reads it, 
Now, you have to remember, this is the 70s. This is under Brezhnev now. And um, in horror, he slams it down. And he says, burn this book. Never show this to anybody. Never. And you are never to speak of this in my presence again. Now get out of here. She didn't burn that book. She kept it hidden. And when Gorbachev came to power, she asked for a meeting with Gorbachev, because by that time she was already a distinguished professor. And she gave him this, and she said, read this, please. You must read this. And that was what prompted the investigation of Katyn and Gorbachev's eventual agreement to release the Da Katyn to the Polish government because of her. But at the time, you see, she went to somebody she thought she could trust. She went to her professor. But you see, you couldn't, not in that system. There was nobody. They, they say, of course, that East Germany was very much like that. Of course, and yeah. so was Czechoslovakia, yeah. and so was Hungary, yeah. and Poland. Yeah. And just to say the obvious, it is against this kind of thing that uh, you have published uh, uh, the Annals of Communism and will be publishing uh, the archive of Stalin himself. Mm -hmm. uh, Stalin himself, uh, I'll tell a little story which I, you know, uh, I just read in a book called The Hawk and the Dove, which is also a pretty good book. But um, he used to uh, he mark up books, and you have mentioned this. He used to mark up books like you just absolutely wouldn't believe. I haven't ever read of a human being who did, I mean, you know, a political figure, who did that to the same extent except in the biographies of John Adams. John Adams did that as well. And in The Hawk and the Dove, it pointed out that when his daughter immigrated to America, it's kind of funny, Khrushchev's son and Stalin's daughter both immigrated to America, as did some of the people whom you had been dealing with. Of course. The CIA gave daughter an intelligence test, and it was, quote, off the charts. So Stalin, having come from uh, being the son of an impoverished uh, shoemaker, I think it was? Shoemaker. Yeah, Jugashvili, in, uh, somewhere in, uh, in uh, Georgia, the state of this. Was a fabulously bright guy, and of course, his daughter, you know, the apple and the tree, not falling far from the tree. Explain what he did with books. As you pointed out, he was reading till four in the morning. Explain what he was doing. He didn't just read books. No. One of discoveries, and I have to take credit for this, unfortunately. And I, but I do, because I went to Moscow with a group of scholars to investigate the Stalin archive. And among the materials in the archive was his library. But none of the scholars wanted to see the library. They were just not interested in it. They were interested in the documents, in the political documents. But I thought, well, I publish books. I want to see what's in his library. Just, I'd like to know if he was reading French detective novels or pornography or if he was reading Marx and Lenin or if, the, if his library was like a law, uh, a lawyer's library filled with all these bound volumes. Um, uh, what was it that was in this library? Uh, they show me a listing and the, I can't make heads or tails of the listing that they give me. I say, listen. Is there a book by Trotsky in Stalin's library? I thought, if there is a book by Trotsky in Stalin's library, that's interesting. And they, at first, the archivist said, no, 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 there's nothing of the sort. And the next day, they brought Trotsky's history of the Bolshevik Revolution. And we opened it, I and the other scholars. And all of a sudden, on page one, all the bell going off. Because on page one, you could see Stalin writing on it. Every line, there was an annotation, underlining, at the, and writing things in the margin like, this is not true, this is not true, maybe this is true, but this is true, and so on and so forth, all the way through. And then at the tops of pages, he wrote, lie, liar, betrayer. And then with his big blue pencil, you could, he would just cross out of the book <laughs> what Trotsky was saying. <laughs> so I thought, well, we're on to something here. <laughs> We are on, sound like a very rational man. <laughs> this, we are on to something yeah. here because Stalin kept no diary. He kept no journal. He had no, no intimate friend to whom he confided his deepest thoughts. He had no lover to whom he uh, wrote love letters. We know nothing of this man as a person. Now we can see who he was 
in the of his own study at four o'clock when nobody is looking, we can see how his mind is working. Well, St Trotsky was his hated enemy. I might write the same thing in a book by my hated enemy. But he had the ability to book, you see. He wanted to know what his hated enemy was thinking, you see. So then I said, well, do you have state and revolution of Lenin? And they brought out a whole bunch of Lenin things for me the next day. And sure enough, start opening these books up. I, I couldn't believe my eyes. They couldn't believe their eyes. Every page was written on. And the cover, the inside of the cover, the title page, all Alan's personal thoughts about Lenin. Uh, he, 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 and, and you would go along and yes, with Trotsky, liar, lies, lie, betrayal, blah, blah, blah. But when he's reading Lenin, yes, he writes dictatorship, uh, so-and-so about the proletariat. But in other sections, he's reading. And in a very fine handwriting, he will mark a section. And in the margin, he wrote style. Style. style you see. He's teaching himself how to write. He's teaching himself how to be a leader. He's teaching himself how to express himself by studying the master. Now, this is, this I thought, this is very interesting. And then he will read five pages and then at the top of page six, he'll summarize his ideas in bullet points. One, two, three, like a graduate student. Right. You see, this is no ordinary uh, mind at work here. This is who really and truly wanted to grasp the essentials of the system and, and understand what he was doing. He wanted to understand the premises of his own behavior. And you see, I don't think he ever truly understood them, but he understood them in a way that most of us do. Most of us aren't Socrates or Jesus Christ. Most of us go about our lives blind to most things because we are in a, 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 a way of thinking about the world and we don't want to have it overturned. So it, I, don't, I don't see Stalin as an exceptional case in that way. It was the world that he constructed, though, that was utterly rationalistic. One of the things that strikes me most when I read these uh, papers of his, he had no moral vocabulary interesting. Yeah, particularly for a Russian, I would think. Yes, no moral vocabulary. That is to say, he would never say, uh, he would never, he would never criticize things on the basis that they were bad. He would never approve things on the basis that they were good. He would never use the word kind. He would never use any of those words that are in our moral vocabulary. If he wanted to denounce you, he would say you were an opportunist or a deviationist. <laughs> A lot of people have said that. Yeah, <laughs> but he wouldn't denounce you on the grounds that you're, yeah. uh, you're a bad person yeah. because what you did broke a moral code. What you did broke a code of discipline of the party. Yeah. Yeah. It's very interesting. Sounds like it's all, uh, his thought process was entire, in that particular respect was uh, entirely political. Yes, yeah. I believe it was. Yeah. And he, he, uh, he read philosophy. He edited a children's book. We have the children's book, and I want to produce a facsimile of it at Yale uh, to show people how dedicated he was to, to instilling in the minds of the people of the Soviet Union these ideas very, very early on. He understood that you have to get the children and that the language the of the books was the way to do it. So people say, well, you know, uh, Marxism, Leninism, it's um, materialistic because it, the premise of it is that economic conditions, uh, uh, econ uh, the, the material conditions of your life uh, are primary. Your thinking and your acting is secondary to those conditions in which you find yourself. But here we find Alan being completely preoccupied with the, with the foundation of thinking. Right. And, and that is what is really fascinating about well, this. I mean, but wasn't that to some extent uh, instrumental with him in that, didn't he believe, I guess as with Lenin, 
that, uh, as I believe it is put in your book, the human being is an, at birth an empty vessel whose, whose views get filled up with the ideology of the time. So they were all creatures of our time and place. And uh, exactly, he, uh, Bukharin, wrote a very important uh, work, uh, I believe 1921, a treatise on historical materialism. And in the middle of this very interesting, he was a sociologist, a theoretician as well as a lawyer. And in the middle of this book, he says, uh, what is a man? A man is a sausage. <laughs> the skin of the man is his personality. Yeah. It's fine. But he's stuffed with all economic determinants of, yeah. of his life, from his father, from his mother, from wh the village he came from. He can't avoid it. Do what you like. You're just a sausage. It's funny. It reminds me of that Scottish dish, which I remember, and also the Jewish dish called kishka. You know, both yeah. of them are just a skin <laughs> stuffed full of stuff. And it's the national dish of Scotland, and I can't remember. Haggish, it. is that it? Pardon me? Haggish? That's it. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, you know, to get back to something, you, something that you were mentioning previously, the church, uh, which apparently through 75 years of Soviet rule, to some extent, the veneration for it never died, which many mm -hmm. people did. Uh, and and what, what, tell what happened in the 20s. You know, one would almost think that Rahm Emanuel got his famous statement, never let a, a, crisis, a good crisis go uh, unused, or however he put right. it. One would think he got it from Lenin Church back. Uh, tell what happened there. Oh, well, there was a crisis in 19, I believe it was 1923, in March 1923. I think that's the date. Um, and um, there was a, a, a bit of a revolt going on in the region. And uh, Lenin, uh, and there was also mass starvation, famine at that time. And Lenin recognized that this was the time to strike at the church, to wipe out the revolt against the Bolsheviks, but because the people were so enervated and destitute that they couldn't rise up against them. And he wrote this unbelievable document, which Richard Pipes uh, discovered in what was called the Secret Lenin Archive, of Lenin's order to the party to, um, uh, to relentlessly and mercilessly destroy the church, yeah. to seize its valuables, and uh, uh, to hang people. For miles and miles, or verses and verses around, people will know and shout. Yeah. Was this uh, something like, only perhaps worse, uh, than the French anti-clericalism of the, of the French Revolution? Um, I'm not a student of the French Revolution. Uh, it, it could be viewed partly on that basis, I guess. I'm not sure what the, the yeah. basis of that was, but in this case, it was to dis utterly an institution that stood in his way. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, I mean, I'm not a historian of the French Revolution yeah. either, but I think the feeling was, and it's been a feeling throughout in many places and many times, that the church uh, was uh, a participant willingly in uh, keeping the poor poor by, by its various doctrines and so forth. In, in this, let me just uh, uh, add something to that, though. In this case, it wasn't just that the church, you see, was acting in a way that was contrary to the best interests of the poor. The church was an institution that stood in the way of the government having absolute power in the country. Ah, uh, yes, 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 indeed. And that was what, what uh, Lenin yeah. was acting on. Yeah. It's Kirov, and what, what is the... What is the what is, why is there the interest, uh, interest in the circumstances surrounding the death of Kirov? The death of Kirov. Uh, Sergei Kirov was uh, the party boss of Leningrad. He was very popular. He was young. He was Russian. He was good looking. He had a lot of friends. Uh, extremely popular. Many have thought that he was a rival of Stalin's, though he and Stalin were good friends, uh, at least surface. Uh, and that Stalin had him assassinated in order to clear the way for Stalin's seizure of complete power. 1934 was at the very, very edge of what came to be known as the Great Terror. 
the Great Terror was something that was instituted by Stalin to purge the party of dissidents, to purge the country of Trotskyites, uh, a lot of all just hokum. It was just all made up. And we now know that many millions of people were sent to the camps, arrested, uh, shot, and so on and so forth. I mentioned that in 1937 alone, nearly a million people were arrested, of which a third were shot outright. Uh, it was, uh, it, it completely convulsed Soviet society. Uh, it, it created, as, as Alexander Yakovlev, Alexander Nikolaevich Yakovlev said to me, and it's confirmed in a multiple of, multiplicity of sources, what the terror did was that it implanted fear at the heart of Soviet society. Strach. Fear. Fear of fathers of their children, children of their fathers, uh, bosses of their employees, employees of their bosses, uh, lovers fearing the, the true credibility of who any, nobody knew who anybody was. It was an utterly existentially uh, uh, ambiguous, anxiety-ridden time. It was beyond belief, frankly, how this society was turned upside down by this event, this cataclysm that has been written about in countless ways. You mentioned Rubashov, Darkness at Noon, Kessler, uh, Robert Conquest's books, and so on and so forth. The event that is thought to have ignited all of this was the assassination of Sergei Kirov on December 2nd, 19, or December 1st, 1934, in, uh, the Lenin in his offices in Leningrad. And no one, of course, Stalin immediately went to Leningrad and he said, you see, this is the work of the Trotskyites. You see, now let's investigate this. And the more he investigated it, sure enough, the more uh, Bukharin, Zinoviev, Kamenev, of course, Trotsky, uh, many others, the head of the secret police, Yagoda, all, everybody was involved. What was the purpose of it? They were trying to uh, usurp the Soviet state. They were trying to assassinate Soviet leaders. And, and that ignited the terror. And that was all fraud. It was fraud. Yeah. It was a fraud. There, there were tiny bits and pockets of resistance to the Soviet uh, power here and there, but in general, there was very, very little that needed to be done. It, it created such utter havoc in the society. In any case, without going into all the dimensions of the terror, but if anybody is interested, I suggest they, they read a little called Sofia Petrovna by Lydia Chukovskaya. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, that's all that we have time for today, but there is much more to be said and learned uh, from Jonathan Brent on the subject of the Soviet Union under Stalin and afterwards. Mr. Brent has kindly uh, agreed that he will come back for a second hour to discuss his book. So be with us again next time when we will once again discuss the book inside the Stalin Archives.